use that. I want to use blue. Okay. Just keep it nice and high. Almost there. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real honor to be here th this morning to tell you um, about one of uh, NASA's ongoing flagship missions, uh, the Kepler mission. Um, I, as, a, as, a, as my introduction noted, um, I'm an end user of the Kepler data. Um, I'm not, not actually on the Kepler team, uh, but the Kepler data is made public uh, sometime after it is taken and uh, then is disseminated to the astronomical community, actually in the public at large, uh, where we can delve into the, uh, individual systems and study them in great detail. Um, but this talk, broadly speaking, is about a, a new field of astronomy, a new field of science called exoplanetary science. And I want to start with the why. Uh, why do we look for planets, exoplanets, around other stars? Um, it, we have three primary goals that I like to, to focus on. Um, the first is that we'd like to understand our origins. Uh, sometime long ago in the past, about 4.5 billion years ago, um, the Earth and the other planets in the solar system formed out of a spinning uh, nebula of disk, uh, uh, gas and dust. Um, somehow that dust and gas coagulated into the planets we have today. Um, and what we'd like to do is be to better understand the processes of planet formation. Um, but the problem is that we're looking at a very uh, difficult logarithmic time scale. Uh, here we are at um, somewhere right around here. Um, several billion years after the formation of the solar system. And we'd like to really understand processes that are happening way back here. Um, this is when the molecular cloud collapsed to form the disk. Um, planets somehow formed within that disk. Gravitational interactions among the planets shaped the eventual architecture of the planetary system. Uh, and we're out here finding planets today. And so our challenge is to go uh, from this r realm where planets are relatively easy or much easier to detect and to view back in time to this very brief period in the history of, of solar systems uh, when the planets formed. So to give a, a, sort of an idea of the scale here, if this all took place on a 24-hour clock, uh, and we're sitting up here near midnight, uh, all of this happened in the first few minutes of the day. And, so, uh, and then it was over. And so what we need to do is better understand our formation processes in that blink of an eye. Um, we'd also like to put our solar system in a much grander galactic context. For a very long time, up until about 1995, um, all of the theories of planet formations, all our conceptions of what a planet would be like around another star, um, were formed by an example of one. And it is very difficult to extrapolate from a single point. Um, understand, this would be like trying to understand all of people by just looking at yourself. And while that works perhaps for teenagers for a short time, um, we all must grow up and come to realize that we are among many. And uh, it's the same with planets as well. We'd like to understand if this sort of uh, architecture that we have in our system uh, with little tiny rocky planets in close, including the subject of the conference, uh, with these big gigantic gas balls out further out um, where good gas giant planets belong, uh, at least that we thought. Um, and we'd like to know if this sort of architecture is typical or if it is actually abnormal. Do we inhabit a unique place within the galaxy? Uh, and ultimately, we're looking for life um, off, off of the Earth. And we heard a little bit about how we might look at uh, some of the moons of the planets in our own solar system. Uh, we're also interested in life on Mars. But uh, we can go beyond that now. Uh, now that we have examples of planets around other stars, we can begin to ask, is there extra, extra solar life? Um, and might there be some other moon around some distant gas giant planet uh, where we can imagine eventually long in the future taking a trip to landing a spacecraft and taking a step out onto these verdant um, hillsides, taking a look around. And this is one of the things about planets, exoplanets in particular, that really captures the public imagination is that more than black holes or neutron stars or white dwarfs or galaxies or things like that, um, planets are actual places. These are locations where humans could go. And I think that that's why they really tug at our heartstrings. So here's the uh, progress of exoplanetary science over the past decade and a half, uh, beginning back here with the first confirmed, undisputed detection of a planet around a sun-like star. 
uh, and then gradually building in time, our detection techniques, our technology increased and, and uh, improved, and, um, and we were able to find planets more and more effectively up until just about the present time. Now, I'd like to uh, show what's happening recently, but I'm going to have to switch to a new y-axis um, because along came Kepler in 2011, and uh, it did this. Um, in 2011, with the first Kepler uh, public data release, there were uh, 1,235 planets. Uh, these were planet candidates. There are ways that astrophysical false positives can arise and mimic a planet. Uh, and it's very important that the, those of us on the ground using large telescope facilities follow up each one of those systems in great detail. But fortunately, there's a way to do it statistically, and my student at Caltech has shown that about 90% of these planet candidates are likely bona fide planets. And so that's encouraging. Uh, the, right off the start, the Kepler data is of such high quality that the false positive rate is much lower than anybody had anticipated. Uh, in 2012, just this year, we added another 1,200 or so planets. And just last week, I received an email from an insider on the Kepler team uh, who sort of whispered in my ear, but I feel like it's, um, I, well, actually, let's say it wasn't somebody on the Kepler team. Let's just say it was somebody out there, a bird in the public or something like that. And uh, there's promise of another 1,200 additional candidates early next year. Um, I don't know if it's just a coincidence or if they're really fond of 1,200, um, but we'll see. Uh, this number is going to increase over the years. So all these planets were found with a specific detection method, uh, the transit method, uh, and where we're looking for eclipses of, st of planets in front of their stars. And the way this works is you simply look at, you don't really resolve the surface of the star, you just measure its overall brightness in time. And repeated measurements of its brightness occasionally reveal little dips in the light curve uh, that are indicative of a planet passing in front of the star and blocking a fraction of the light. Um, and from this transit light curve, you can read right off of it based on the depth. You can get the ratio of the planet's radius to the star's radius. Um, if you do follow-up Doppler spectroscopy, you can watch the star move in, in, in response to the gravitational tug of the planet. And that gives you um, the true mass of the planet. And right away, you can get the density of these planets orbiting other stars. Um, the NASA Kepler mission is special in this regard in that it's a space telescope. Uh, that is devoted to the task of finding transiting planets. It single-mindedly stares at one little quadrant of the galaxy. Uh, this is the Kepler field of view. It's 10 degrees on a side. It's about the size of your hand at an arm's length. And within this field are millions of stars. Of those millions, 160,000 of those stars have been selected to be approximately sun-like and stable. And Kepler, the Kepler telescope measures the brightnesses of those stars every 30 minutes and has been doing so for about three and a half years. And so it's interesting to think that during the 30 minute duration of this talk, we will be getting one new measurement of 160,000 stars in the Kepler field. And some fraction of those, well, maybe one or two, maybe a dozen, will start to go down ever so slightly as a planet transits in front of it. Um, here is one of the smallest planets that has both a mass and a radius as measured by Kepler. This was announced by Natalie Batala et al. Uh, just last year. This is Kepler 10b, very romantically named. And um, the fun thing about exoplanets is you actually just show it on a low resolution um, projector to scale. So here's the orbit path. You can ignore that and zoom in on that little dot. That's Kepler 10b. And, and that's the actual size in relationship to its star. Um, it's a very unusual planet by solar system standards in that it has a period of only about 19 hours. So I wouldn't want to have to pay taxes on that planet. Um, and follow-up Doppler measurements indicate this is about four and a half Earth masses, and the radius based on the transit depth is about 1.4 Earth radii. There are a large number of very small planets that are being discovered by the Kepler mission. And this is a distribution of the number of planets per star with periods only less than 50 days. We're sensitive to planets much further out than this, but this is where we are very complete. And as plotted as a function of the radius of the planet in Earth radii. And here you can see the Jupiter-sized planets moving in towards the Neptune-sized planets. And you can see this power law increase towards ever smaller planets. And a careful extrapolation to the next bin or two over indicates that there may be um, more small planets than stars in the galaxy. 
there may be about one to three Earth-sized planets, maybe even more in terms of Mars-sized planets, per star in the galaxy. So this is a very exciting uh, initial statistical result. Um, but each one of these planets, um, especially these tiny ones, deserves a little bit of extra attention. Um, I want to also show some of the interesting multi-transiting systems that Kepler has found. He's found the very first multi-transiting system. Um, these are the first multi-planet systems that were discovered by the Doppler wobble technique, showing kind of a rich diversity of multiple systems with gas giant planets, a few Neptunes scattered around in there. Uh, so this was an impressive haul before the launch of Kepler. Once Kepler launched, uh, we had mul not only multi-planet systems, but multi-transiting systems where you can get their sizes in great detail. And uh, here's the similar plot for what Kepler's found. And it's an impressive array of little micro solar systems uh, around other stars. And down here, there's a very weird one. All these plot symbols are scaled relative to the sizes of the planets. And showing the relative sizes of the planets. And this is a very uh, oddball system right down here, KOI 961, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a few slides. Um, before I get there, though, I want to motivate, instead of looking for tiny planets around sun-like stars, which is the uh, mission directive of the Kepler mission, uh, specifically look for Earth-like planets around sun-like stars, um, I want to argue for some of Kepler's tiniest targets that were more or less accidentally selected. Remember, they selected those 160,000 stars to look more or less like the sun, but they actually grabbed a few M dwarfs or red dwarfs while they were at it. And just to give you a, a reminder, I'm going to refer to these, you know, these are commonly known as red dwarf stars in comparison to the sun. Here's Procyon and F star or Vega. Um, I might also refer to these as M stars uh, because of this confusing astronomical uh, naming scheme here. But the key is to remember that these M dwarfs or red dwarfs are much smaller, they're much fainter, and they're much cooler than the sun. And this actually, because, even though they're this, some of the galaxy's smallest denizens, um, they hold a lot of advantages for looking for the smallest planets in the galaxy. Um, here's a lineup of all, uh, or this is kind of a snapshot of the very, very initial planet detections found by Kepler. Uh, here's the sun in comparison. Here's some very massive stars. But again, I want to focus right down here on the little guys. And one of the advantages of small stars when you're looking for small planets, are, here's an example of two super Earth mass planets compared to their stars, Gliese 1214 and Corot 7. Um, this one is an M dwarf star, and you can see that the transit signal is very deep because the fractional area blocked by the planet is relatively large. This instead, the small planet around a sun-like star, here it is on the same scale, that tiny little divot there, and you zoom in, and you can kind of see that it has about the same noise properties, but the signal is much, much less. So the M dwarfs hold a lot of promise for finding these tiny planets, at least for detecting them. For those of us that are also interested in potential habitability, the first step on the road to determining whether something, a planet could be habitable, is determining whether it resides in the so-called habitable zone. And this might not even be the only criterion, it's just one. And I want to be really careful in referring to, not to habitable planets, which sometimes happens in the press, but I want to talk about habitable zone planets. Uh, and note that there are probably 12 other factors or 24 other factors after that. But here is um, a planetary system around a star named 55 Cancri and its habitable zone with respect to its inner three planets. And here is a very nearby red dwarf star and its habitable zone. It's much smaller, uh, and which means that it's much closer to the star, which means that there's a larger geometric probability that it will pass along our line of sight to the star. And also, um, <clears throat> it will complete many more orbital cycles per observing season. So you get to see the planet pass in front of the star more frequently than you would for a habitable planet around a sun-like star. So again, you get to enhance the signal compared to the noise uh, for the planets around these little tiny red dwarf stars. So here's just a little chart comparing the advantages of this, uh, maybe a, a quarter solar mass M dwarf to the sun. The transit depth is an order of magnitude deeper. The RV signal of a habitable, oops, sorry, habitable zone, Earth, is about an order of magnitude larger. And the location is much closer, meaning that for every year of observing that Kepler does, you get to see an order of magnitude more orbits go by. 
So <clears throat> the problem, though, with the M-dwarfs is that because they're so unlike our sun, we don't really have the sun as a touchstone for understanding their stellar properties. And because the depth of the transit only gives you the ratio of the planet's radius to the star's radius, you need to know the star's properties in order to understand the planet's properties. So the keys to understanding planets around other, around other stars are the stars themselves. And from here on, I want to use the example of Kepler Object of Interest 961. It might be your favorite, too. Hopefully, after this, it will be. And it also has recently been designated Kepler 42. It has graduated to full Kepler-recognized planet. Um, the problem with this interesting little tiny star is that none of its physical properties were known very well at all. All of these could vary by factors of several. And while that might work for some areas of astronomy, it doesn't really work if you're trying to determine the size of a planet. Um, one of the keys to under unraveling this mystery is a very interesting fellow named Kevin Apps, who's an amateur astronomer in England, and uh, we collaborate by email. And every once in a while, he'll send me an email and tell me about something very interesting that he's come across in various catalogs. Now, Kevin's unique talent is the ability to retain several catalogs worth of information in his head at any time and cross-correlate that information. Uh, so that if you give him a star name, he can instantly tell you its colors, its location, when you can observe it. Um, if it has a binary companion, he can just go down the list. He's really amazingly talented um, in, in that regard. And um, he's a no normal amateur. He has 24 referee publications and 49 planet discoveries to his credit. Uh, here he is receiving the Astronomical Society of the Pacific Amateur Achievement Award, uh, which was long overdue, I felt. Um, he noted in his email to me, he said, John, did you realize that that's one of the smallest planet-hosting stars in the Kepler sample is an almost identical twin to Barnard's star? And I said, no, uh, only you know that, Kevin. Uh, but <laughs> thanks for sharing that with me. And um, this is really important because Barnard's star, uh, because it actually has a proper name and everything, is very nearby and actually relatively bright. Uh, it's only six light years away. Uh, making it the second closest stellar system to the Earth. And um, Barnard's star, because of its proximity, has all of its physical properties uh, very well measured, including its mass, its radius. You can it's so close that we can actually measure its angular radius on the sky with interferometric techniques. So we actually have an angular diameter for this star. We know its luminosity, temperature, age is fairly well known. Uh, and so because it's a twin, well, actually, we didn't believe Kevin at, at first, so we used the world's largest telescope to gather a spectrum of this thing. Um, we invested 15 minutes of keck time, which might not sound like much, but each minute costs about $167. Um, we should have just taken Kevin's word for it, because uh, in red is the spectrum of KOI 961, the star, compared to Barnard's star. And basically, these are indiscernible. They have the exact same chemical fingerprint uh, encoded on their spectra. And so Kevin's instincts, based on all of his catalog information in his brains, were exactly right. Um, we also got an infrared spectrum at Palomar Observatory. Uh, we were able to get it, uh, a few more detailed properties, such as its metallicity. We measured uh, the strength of its sodium and calcium features in the spectrum of the star. And uh, we were able to do this differential analysis, which um, this is a little bit too detailed, but basically we were able to take Barnard Star's well-measured properties and just transfer them one by one over to this unknown KOI 961. So it became a known quantity. And we did that, something very remarkable happened. Remember on that other slide, it looked like it had very large planets. And that's because people mistakenly thought it was a very large star. Well, we shrunk the star by many factors, about a factor of five, and we actually refitted the light curves in light of the new stellar information. And that shrunk the planets a bit further still. And when we were done, um, we found that these three planets that were found around 961, romantically named O1, O2, and O3, uh, were all smaller than the Earth. Um, O1 has a radius about 78% the radius of the Earth, 71% the radius of the Earth, and 57% the radius of the Earth, making it the first exo-Mars-sized planet that had ever been discovered. Now, these do not reside anywhere near the habitable zone, all of their orbital periods are less than two days. The inner one completes an orbit every 11 hours. So these are fairly scorchingly hot, um, not unlike Arizona, which we heard about earlier, but probably way less habitable. And um, what's really remarkable is that when we went to do the press release for this discovery, uh, we wanted to put it in context of the other planetary systems that had been found. So we tried the solar system with Mercury. 
And if KOI-961 was about this big, then Mercury was way across the room, so that wouldn't really fit on a figure very well. Then we said, how about the first hot Jupiter? Still, you got the sense of scale, you just lost the tiny little 961 planets. So the only analog that we came up with was Jupiter and its four largest moons, the Galilean satellites. And here they are shown with their orbits scaled uh, relative to one another. And the planet sizes and the star size compared to Jupiter are scaled uh, proportionately to one another. And so you can see is that we have a Galilean-like planetary system containing a Mars-sized planet. Uh, so this is just a glimpse of what's to come from the Kepler mission. We're finding, I started off when, before Kepler launched, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if they found a couple of Earth-sized planets? Maybe even 1.5 Earth masses. I'd be pretty happy with that. But here we are plunging down into Mars-sized worlds. Um, here is a sense of scale for the orbits of these planets. This is the size of the sun. So the inner planet in the system has an orbital radius that's only about the size of the solar radius. And here's the star for comparison. Uh, and here's the outer planet out here. So one of the first questions that came to our mind is how common are these microplanetary systems? We found one. Is there anything that we can say? And it turns out there is something you can say. Um, it turns out that not all planetary systems have planets that transit their stars viewed from the Earth. Many of these are oriented in space such that they don't eclipse their stars. But one out of about 10 for the geometric configuration of 961 will transit. So if you see one, then you've probably seen 10. And uh, the famous quote from our press conference was that it's like a cockroach. If you see one in your kitchen, you're, there's probably many else that are hiding. <laughs> Um, and then what we did is we took a look at the distribution of stellar masses for all of the Kepler target stars, shown on this logarithmic histogram. You can see there's lots of them that right around the sun-like stars here. And here are all the, planet, or sorry, all the stars that have planetary candidates. And this is by far the reddest, smallest target uh, star with a planet in that field. And if you just sort of take a ratio uh, to this one, of this one to the ones around it, you come up with about one, thir one out of 30. But remember, you missed about nine. So that means about 10 out of 30 throughout the galaxy have these little microplanetary systems. And this is especially important because the red dwarf stars outnumber sun-like stars by a large margin. About 75% of all stars in the galaxy are little red dwarf stars. So these might make up the majority of all planetary systems throughout the galaxy. So the key points about Kepler-42, uh, uh, formerly known as KOI-961, is that these are the three smallest planets that have ever been discovered around a normal star. Uh, it has a Mars-sized planet. It's the most compact system of planets in terms of their size and their orbital periods. Uh, it's the least massive star known to harbor a planet. Uh, and this is all thanks to the NASA Kepler mission uh, with a uh, follow-up on the ground from Keck and Palomar observatories. And uh, it implies that these tiny planetary systems are common, maybe as much as 30% throughout the galaxy. And uh, we're uh, in studying additional Kepler planetary systems to firm up that number. Um, so here we are talking about Mars, and you know we have Mars orbiting our sun. And uh, we now have this new perspective on Mars-sized planets and planets overall throughout the galaxy. Uh, th this might be the more common type of planetary system than our setup. Um, and just to give a quick preview, I was asked to show something a little bit new. Um, this is an, uh, another system that we have under study. This um, one is about 80% the radius of the Earth, ranging out to about twice the radius of the Earth, all within uh, a semi-major axis range that's about a third of Mercury's. So uh, again, you know, uh, we found that first one. We're finding additional ones, and uh, we're studying all of these in great detail. So um, additional information on all of this can be found at Kepler's website. I encourage you to take a look at it if you haven't. My personal research and my group and the work that we're doing in the Kepler field can be found here at the exolab.caltech.edu. And I also wanted to bring to your attention those of you that like to get involved with analyzing Kepler data on your own. It's not just astronomers like me. The Kepler data is available to everyone. And uh, there's this great interface developed by a, t a team led by Deborah Fisher at Yale called planethunters.org where you can flip through one, transit or one light curve after the next. And as you're flipping through them, if you happen to see little deviations downward that look like a transit, you can flag them. And citizen scientists using uh, Planet Hunters have found about 10 planetary systems on their own by scanning through tens of thousands of these light curves. 
using this impressive computer that we have sitting right here in our brain, which is actually starting to outperform some of the automated routines that we use to sift through these light curves. So please take a look at it or encourage your students or kids to look at it as well. And with that, I'll thank you and thank my collaborators. <clears throat>